those, um, those traits recorded on individual animals, we can look at the, the, um, what genetic um, variation exists for eating quality and relate it to other traits. So that feeds into those, those eating quality scores actually um, feed into the MSA retail grading system so that um, if you have a higher eating quality score um, on that 0 to 100 scale, um, then that corresponds to higher MSA retail grades. And then the last bit down the bottom there is that for those uh, MSA retail grades, we have um, data from willingness to pay surveys um, which inform us how much uh, consumers will be willing to pay for, for different MSA grades. So on this slide here, now we have that the, um, the um, red bell curve there is just a representation of the variation that we see on the, on the 0 to 100 point scale for eating quality. And we can see how that um, super, superimposes on top of, of MSA grades. So we've actually got a large amount of between animal variation in eating quality and therefore in MSA grade. So if we could uh, increase the proportion of meat in, in um, if we could improve eating quality score, that would lead to an increase in the proportion of meat in higher MSA grades and that would um, in theory lead to an increase in value. And just how we do that to put a, an actual dollar value on that, um, if we, um, what that graph shows you is, is going from the red to the blue bars, that's uh, changing MSA grade by MSA score by one unit. And what we can see there is that that results in less ungraded meat and a higher proportion of, of uh, animals or, or meat in, um, in the higher grades. Uh, so what you're seeing now there is, is uh, the results of the, um, um, the willingness to pay surveys. So those numbers in the, in the yellow there, in the yellow line, show you um, how much consumers are willing to pay relative to um, three-star meat. So um, if meat's ungraded, uh, people would pay half as much as they would for, for three-star meat. If it was four-star meat, they're willing to pay half as much again. And if, um, if it's five-star meat, they would be willing to pay twice as much as they would be for three-star. So putting that all together, an increase of one score on our, our uh, 0 to, to 100 point scale um, would give you an increase in carcass price, price of 15 cents per kilogram. That is if there was um, supply chain feedback from the consumer back to the, to the land producer. And that turns into an economic value of $3.21 per U per uh, increase in in one score unit. Okay, so we've included that um, eating quality economic value into an index with other carcass traits and you can see those in the table. You can see the economic values for each of those traits just to give yourselves a bit of context. But in that um, breeding objective or index, uh, the traits that we consider as uh, sale weight, so post weaning weight in this case, uh, lean meat yield, dressing percent, um, eye muscle, carcass eye muscle and fat, and also eating quality score. So on that that uh, zero to 100 uh, point scale. So you can see in the second column there of that table, right down the bottom, um, I'm calling eating quality um, TMSA. So that just means um, um, that that's our eating quality trait that we'll be looking at later on, and. It just refers to um, MSA score on the 0 to 100 point scale and T is for top side. So that, um, those, um, the economic values in those tables, that represents an index and if you look down the bottom, we've got three variations that we can consider. Um, just um, an index I call LMY, that's, that's the carcass index there but without the last row without eating quality and that would be actually a dollar index which is basically equivalent to the current carcass plus. 
And then the second index is um, includes all of those traits in the table, so I call that one LMYEQ, and that's a carcass index with eating quality. So, and then the, the final index that we'll be looking at today is called, I call it LMYEQIMF. Um, clearly needs a better name than that, but that's what we're calling it at the moment. So that's just the LMYEQ index, but with extra emphasis placed to increase intramuscular fat. Okay, so as I said at the beginning of the seminar, we, there's evidence now that uh, that increasing lean meat yield and growth can, you know, will in, uh, lead to uh, a reduction in eating quality, and that's reflected in these unfavourable genetic correlations that you can see in this table here. So we've got lean meat yield and um, eating quality, and you can see a negative genetic correlation there of of minus 0.19. So these results come from the, um, the, the, the carcass measurements in the, the CRC um, um, from the information nucleus and uh, resource flock um, that, that where, that, where those data have been collected. So you can see a, a negative ge genetic correlation so that if we increase lean meat yield, um, that feeding quality will tend to go down. Then a couple of other um, antagonisms we have, intramuscular fat and shear force. They are both um, um, quite strongly related to both lean meat yield and eating quality, but you'll notice there that they go in the opposite directions. So what, what's happening is that um, higher lean meat yield is associated with lower intramuscular fat and higher shear force, whereas for eating quality, TMSA, it's the other way around. So higher, higher eating quality is associated with higher intramuscular fat and lower shear force. And um, I should say that in our index, um, well, eating quality is part of the breeding objective, but the traits that we're going to use to influence it are intramuscular fat and shear force from the, from the, um, from the information nucleus um, and resource flock records. That's what I've just said. Um, okay, so um, so what all that means is that it's hard to jointly improve lean meat yield and eating quality. If you look at this um, sort of stylized graph that I've got here, where you would actually like to go is as, as fast as you possibly could up to the right-hand corner. But that uh, blue line there um, just shows you the limits of where you can go while you're trying to improve both traits. Um, where each arrow goes to is, is approximately where you get to after 10 years of selection. So with Carcass Plus, um, we could get um, up to a 1% a, um, a increase over 10 years in lean meat yield, but that would be associated with um, uh, almost one and a half um, um, point reduction in eating quality. Um, the second index up there, lean meat, the LMY, that's our carcass-based equivalent to car uh, Carcass Plus, and um, it, it does a little bit better on lean meat yield, but it's, it's, um, we're seeing the reduction in eating quality again. Now, uh, the line there that's pointing to LMYEQ, that's our um, index with eating quality included. And uh, you can see there that we're still getting an increase in lean meat yield, and, but we're essentially holding eating quality constant. So that's better. But, uh, and then the last index there you can see is LMYEQ IMF. So that's with our extra emphasis on intramuscular fat. And that's basically holding lean meat yield um, constant, but, but um, getting, now getting an increase in eating quality. And so we have those different indexes um, um, available for consideration. Um, in discussions that, that I've had with various people, um, the consensus so far has been that it would be best to, um, to push towards the, um, the LMYEQ IMF index. So that's what we've got the results for at the moment. But um, as part of this consultation is, is 
all about uh, seeing what you, you people think and so uh, we're interested in your feedback to, to um, work out what direction we should be and how hard we should be pushing um, eating quality with respect to, to lean meat yield as well. Okay, so um, this slide here, just to see it again, but um, we have a high genetic correlation between the breeding objectives Carcass Plus and our, our LMY index. So the LMY was the, um, the carcass based equivalent to Carcass Plus, carcass trait uh, equivalent. Um, whereas down the bottom there, our eating quality indexes have um, a fairly low correlation with Carcass Plus. So um, the, the point I, I wanted to make there was that these new indexes are quite different to um, what the Carcass Plus index currently is. Okay, so um, that's how we developed the, the breeding objective and the index. I just next wanted to talk about um, our new ASBVs for carcass traits. This is another change which is about to happen and, and I think that there will be a, a further webinar which goes into this in more detail but I just want to talk about the, the aspects that are relevant to the index. So, um, we need carcass and eating quality um, ASBVs for this index. Now these have been available as research breeding values since 2011 so the traits that um, um, have been available include lean meat yield, dressing percent, um, eye muscle and fat and, and IMF and shit force. So to date those have just been full trade analyses. We've been including information via the called single step analysis, we won't go into um, in detail but all that means is that we just include um, pedigree, uh, performance phenotypes on the carcass traits and genomic information in one single analysis which is the, is the theoretically optimal way to do it. But in a sense those analyses have been fairly limited in scope because they've only included the resource population animals from the the INF and the resource flock with their measurements and genotypes in addition to animals genotyped by breeders and in pilot projects and so on and some animals from the extended pedigree of, of those first two animals. So um, we, we've actually, there are about 50,000 animals with breeding values um, being produced in each analysis. So now in the next few weeks we're about to make the transition from research breeding values to ASBVs and what that involves is a new analysis which is now going to be a full multi-trait single step genomic analysis and it's going to include not just the carcass and eating quality traits but body weight and scan traits um, as well. Further to that we're going to include data from all land plan animals from, from 2000 onwards and this means that all animals, um, current animals that are of relevance to people will have breeding values for all traits but of course um, reporting will still be subject to the accuracy thresholds that are adopted. So it's going to be ASBVs from this analysis which are going to be used to build the eating quality index. And I just wanted to show you um, some genetic trends that have come out of that analysis. Um, we've got, um, there you can see the trends for the, the, the key traits that are in the index. So we've got um, the trend in post weaning weight, an increase of a bit over three kilos since 2007. Um, I started at 2007 because that's when the carcass trait measurements start. Um, you can also see there a, uh, an increase of um, about 0.7% in lean meat yield, um, an increase of, of a bit over half a millimetre in carcass eye muscle, not terribly much change in carcass fat and um, intramuscular fat's the same but it does appear to be going down, certainly in that graph and we've got a positive trend in shear force. So that's um, uh, those last two graphs are just sort of um, highlighting the fact that it's, it's supporting the, the, the fact that um, eating quality is likely to go down with as lean meat yield goes up. We've got one question come in, Swanee. Sure. Um, so we've got why use Carcass Plus 
and not LAM 2020 or an index with weighting on birth weight and lambing ease if the accuracy is too low to report a trait? Is it still used in the index? So I'm guessing there's two questions there, just no question mark in between. Yeah, so for the first question, we use Carcass Plus because we, um, because this is really a index and we just wanted to simplify it by not, um, not including WEC and um, mute. the other thing about WEC is that there's not, it, it seemed to me that there wasn't very much data being recorded um, in the industry so I um, haven't included it in the index as yet. So it's really just not to complicate it with, with additional traits at the moment. There's no reason why we wouldn't add those traits in later on and um, you know that's Part, as part of the feedback process, we'll, we'll consider that too. So the second question, Karis, was, I don't know whether that's... So it was, if the accuracy is too low to report a trait, is it still used in the index? Yes, yeah, so um, what happens with indexes is that we, we calculate them using all of the traits um, ASBVs, whether they meet an accuracy threshold or not. But then the, there's, a, there's also an accuracy threshold for the index. So um, um, you know, you might have one out of six traits below the below the threshold for reporting, but the the um, the index still might have an accuracy high enough to be reported. Um, and of course, if all oh, traits God. were not particularly accurate, then we wouldn't get a, an in, the index accuracy would be most likely not to be um, high enough to be reported as well. So um, that's the way index accuracy is is handled. Okay, so I thought it'd just be important to um, talk a little bit about how how you get an ASBV that that um, um, reasonably accurate one for carcass and eating quality traits, given that they're only measured in uh, the resource populations at the moment. So the important thing is that you need to be linked to the genomic resource population. So that's the, the um, was the CRC's information nucleus. It's now the MLA's funded um, resource um, block. So in order to do that, um, it's a good idea to use sides who've been genotyped and progeny tested as part of that, that population. But also, um, if you can, to try and get your own size um, to be used in, in the resource po population and then they'll be progeny tested themselves. And then the last thing to do is that you can genotype your, genotype. your RAM selection candidates or some of them. Um, so that's basically um, what you can do at the moment. Um, <coughs> one of the things that is being worked on in the CRC, um, as I'm sure that you would be aware, is, is putting um, carcass measurement technology into abattoirs and for both for lean meat yield and for intramuscular fat. Um, so now, perhaps in future, um, we can start to think about a situation where there's more data being generated for for these traits, so um, which will help get more accurate ASBVs. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today was what the in indexes actually look like on real animals, and um, well, first of all. Um, We'll look at that in a minute, but these are the predicted trait gains over 10 years. Assuming that you, um, you're a, a land plan uh, block and you're recording the standard traits of, of um, body weight, um, scanned muscle and fat, and, so, and that you are doing some level of genotyping and that's giving you some accuracy for the carcass traits. Oh, so you can see there on the graph the blue bars are show, showing the percentage of the economic gain um, which is coming from each trait. You see that the, the biggest trait there is, is post weaning weight, uh, um, just under 30%. Then we have lean meat yield, almost 10%, dressing percent a little bit more. Um, eye muscle, uh, carcass eye muscle is um, up to 20%, fat is... Um, just slightly positive and our eating quality TMSA is is accounting for 
uh, between 20 and 25% of the incoming gain and intramuscular fat down there at around 5%. And the numbers there you can see next to that graph are a predicted change based on the genetic parameters that we estimate coming from the CRC flock. So we predict um, almost three kilos of, of gain in body weight, 0.87% um, uh, in lean meat yield, um, dressing percent going up, um, carcass thigh muscle going up, a reduction in carcass fat, um, and eating quality increase of 1.4 of scores, so that's on our 0 to 100 scale, and IMF going up slightly as well. By contrast, if you look at the numbers next to that, those are the predicted gains in these traits if we were to select on Carcass Plus. So getting more on body weight and lean meat yield in particular, uh, more on carcass eye muscle, but you can see there the reductions in eating quality and IMF. So those are predicted gains. Um, on this next slide, I've got some, um, some indexes calculated for um, some real animals. So these, these animals are the size in the land plan analysis of the two, 2015 drop. There's um, 1,252 size there. And on the y-axis, we've got the, the eating quality index, that's LMYEQIMF. And on the x-axis, we've got uh, that plotted against Carcass Plus. And you can see there there's a correlation between the indexes of 0.56, so that gets back to the point that I made that the indexes look quite different. Um, if you look at the lines that I've drawn on that graph, firstly, um, the horizontal line, um, animals that are above that line are in the top 10% on that eating quality index. And you can see I've plotted there, uh, I've in the table there, I've got the averages of those, those size for the individual traits. That's actually the average compared to the mean, which is in the right-hand column. So for post-weaning weight, um, the average ASBV of those size, those 1,200 size is 13.29 kilograms. And um, for our, if we take the top 10% on the, the new eating quality index, they would be 1.39 kilos um, better than that. And if you look down that column, um, they're, they're higher for eye muscle, they're also higher for fat, they're slightly higher for lean meat yield, um, higher for eye muscle, um, a little bit positive for carcass fat, and you can see down the bottom there, they're, they're positive for intramuscular fat and negative for shear force. On the other hand, if the vertical line there shows the cutoff point for the top 10% on the Carcass Plus index, and you can see that they're quite a bit heavier. Um, their ASBV for post weaning weight is 3.14 kilos heavier than the average. Um, more for, relative to the eating quality index, they're more for um, eye muscle, um, a little bit lower for fat. Um, they're a lot higher for lean meat yields, but down the bottom there, they are now uh, negative for intramuscular fat and higher for shear force, which is um, a negative effect on eating quality. So you can see there that um, 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 I've just, in between those two lines, where perhaps you can see that they're light blue um, size, there, there are a few animals there that, that are in the top on both indexes, but by and large, that's, it's, um, it's, yeah, there are, are quite the animals that you're picking on this eating quality index are quite different to the animals that would be picked on the Carcass Plus index. So that's one example. I have now have a second example, and that's these are animals from the CRC information nucleus that were actually part of the eating quality trial. So these 877 animals on this graph were actually um, slaughtered, and they were um, samples from them were cooked up and eaten by the, the consumers and scored for, for eating quality. And so here we have the, the indexes and you can see a, a much lower correlation in this case that's um, going more towards the, the correlations between the objectives that we saw 
some uh, number of slides back. At what you can see is that if we chose those the animals on um, on the eating quality index, they will be slightly below average for post weaning weight, but they do have um, higher eye muscle, um, um, slightly lower for fat. There's, a, there's still a positive effect on lean meat yield, but down the bottom there you can see intramuscular fat uh, 0.49 and shear force minus 0.32. Um, whereas if we selected them on Carcass Plus, you can see um, now a lot more positive for body weight, um, bigger response in eye muscle, lean meat yield, but negative for intramuscular fat and positive for shear force. This time what I've done, because these animals were, um, were part of the eating quality trial, we can actually calculate a, a, independent breeding value for eating quality and that's, that's what's, um, and if I select on that, if I selected these animals on eating quality breeding value, you can now see that in the last row, I didn't explain it before, but um, um, the top 10% on the eating quality index would have an eating quality breeding value of plus 1.04 and, but on the carcass plus just um, very close to zero there. Whereas if we select them actually on eating quality, um, their eating quality, the average breeding value would be 4.71. So that, that just shows you the, the type of variation that's there, but how difficult it is to get when you're trying to balance it with lean meat yield. Okay, so just coming to the, the end of the, the presentation, um, just some, some conclusions from the, the work that we've done. Um, what I've tried to show you, I hope, is that focusing on increased yield leads to a decline in eating quality. Um, we've also seen that the resource established by the CRC and MLA and, and various other people has now, it, it's, it really is a fabulous resource and it's given us the tools to be able to improve eating quality. Um, we've seen antagonistic relationships between traits um, and those mean that large gains in both yield and eating quality at the same time are unrealistic. But we can jointly improve them. Um, it is possible to do that, but um, you really need to be, be looking at the, the index to do that. And, and the last thing is to get the most out of the index, breeders need to be linked to the reference flock via genotyping some of your animals or, um, or some level of progeny testing, whether it's your own animals or using progeny tested sires from the, from the nucleus. So um, that's the end of the presentation. So I, I guess we have time for some questions or comments. Karis. So we've got one question that's already come through, which is a bit better than we did yesterday with the maternal index. We had to wait a little while, so thank you for that. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll go through a few questions that you guys might have. Um, we'll also then open up a survey tomorrow morning that we'd like you to fill out. Um, that will just have a few questions of how much weighting you'd like to put on eating quality and see in the in intermuscular fat in the index, um, as well as a few other things. So the first question that we've got for Swanee today is if carcass weight was held, um, how could we or how much gain could we make with eating quality in IMF? If carcass weight was held? Yes, my computer's having a spaz, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okay. <laughs> So, so the, the indexes um, assume that um, that we're targeting a particular carcass weight. So improvements in growth, for example, would would mean that you would be able to slaughter animals earlier. Yep. Okay. Maybe the person who's asked that question can clarify a bit more. So we've got another question here. What proportion of the flock should be genotyped now? It was previously recommended at 20% of rams. Yeah, yeah. 
So with 20% uh, of RAMs, you can, um, you know, the expectation is that you would get about 80% of the gain that's possible. So um, you know, that's it's still probably about an optimal level for people. Um, you know, in an ideal world, you'd be able to genotype everything, but it's still um, too costly to do that. So that figure of 20% still holds, I think, is a reasonable figure. 20% of the rams that are candidates for, for selection. Yeah. And going on from that, so is there any point in genotyping, genotyping use? Um, I think there's less value in genotyping use because the, you know, most of the selection um, that you get comes from the ram side. Okay, another question that's come through is one of the earlier slides put the value of eating quality at 15 cents per kilo and the value at what per year? $3.21 per year, I think it was. I think we've got a clarification on the carcass weight question as well. So when targeting 25 kilo carcass weight, are we able to increase lean meat yield and IMF? Um, yes, yes. That's, that's what the, the index is targeting, so. It target, targets a fixed carcass weight, but um, like improvements in growth lead you to um, to be able to slaughter earlier, provided you can feed lambs to get there. Okay, so what we'll do is we've got a few more minutes before we were hoping to wind up. So if there are more questions that come through, we will. Um, ask Andrew about them, otherwise we'll end this webinar now. Um, so just uh, for those that did come in late, uh, you can now put through all of your questions through the chat system. Um, we'll ask those questions to Andrew or at least take down the notes and hopefully address them this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, we'll also be opening a survey where you can fill out to give your feedback on um, your thoughts and opinions on the index and we'll take those in, collate those into um, some responses that we can give back to Andrew when he's developing the next step of these indexes. So we've got another question come through, Swanee. So if we are using selling ram lambs at six months, we'll need genotype results back faster than 12 weeks to be able to use or sell using this new index with accuracy. Yeah. I I will have to take that as a comment. <laughs> I, and, and all I can do is agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is something where, and um, there is in at the moment to get them into Australia. Um, but at this stage, a lot of it, the time we are held up is actual testing time. So we'll be able to speed it up a little bit um, until there's new technology out there. I'm not sure how much we, we can get it. Um, but it is a good point, it will make things a little bit better and maybe having to genotype a few more animals to be making selection earlier on that instead. So, value per U, $3.21, 25 kilo lamb, point or 15 kilo is $3.00. Someone's questioning. Yeah, um, um, well, I would have to dig the exact calculations out, but it, it includes a reproduction rate and a a, uh, a discount factor as well. So, um, you know, there's a bit more to the multiplication than that. Okay. Uh, so we have two more questions. Not, not uh, that much more, I would say. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I trust you, Swanee. Um, so we've got two. One's probably for George and the other one's probably for Dave. Uh, sorry, not George, uh, for Swanee and the other one's for Dave. So guess who asked the question? How do we balance maturity patterns? 
maturity patterns? Um, well, it's it's not yeah the, um, it's not something that we normally consider in a terminal fire index because we're we're um, really valuing just the the um, the lamb side of the equation here. The maturity patterns comes into um, breeding objectives, which are targeting the, the dam side, which is either, you know, usually a merino or a maternal type ewe. Okay. The next question was, will these be added to RAM Select? So, will, once these indexes are public, uh, they will be available to RAM Select. But I thought Dave might be able to give a little bit more insight on how the two work and um, why they'll be able to have those indexes there. Uh, that's a good question. I think we'll just add them in. The, the RAM Select doesn't really care what indexes are there. Um, it just takes advantage of whatever's available, or whatever we feed into it. So um, it ends up with all the data from each analysis. Uh, I am kind of assuming at this stage that it will just show up. Yeah, look, I, I think, think that um, this it would be an important index to get into RAM, RAM Select, but uh, you know the details need to be worked out. Um, once it's been bedded in um, into the land plan first is the, is the first priority. But uh, going on from there, um, getting it available through RAM Select would be um, very beneficial as well. The next question is probably more about moving towards the single step analysis. Uh, I'm not sure how much you'll know, Andrew, but the question is how many more animals will get ASBVs for eating quality once we do move to that single step? Yeah, that's um, we still um, we're still in the process of working that out, and um, so I can't actually give you an answer at the moment. I mean, we have um, we have to set work out where to set the accuracy thresholds and. Um, part of that is is um, is um, accommodating the improvement in accuracy that's given by genomic information. It's it's the one thing that we're just in the process of finalising at the moment. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you today. But um, I think that there will be a webinar in a week or two um, on analysis changes, and hopefully, we'll be able to address it by then. So that's a good segue um, into the next webinar that we will be holding. Uh, so just to fill everyone in with the analysis changes that we're hoping to get underway the first week of May, we'll hold another webinar open to all uh, clients. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, what we'll do probably we'll finish up now. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll put a link of this onto our YouTube channel. And we'll send that link as well as the survey that we'd like you guys to fill out in an email tomorrow morning. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you want to give any feedback on the index, the only way to get it in and through to Swanee is through that survey. So uh, the best thing to do is to fill it out. It also has um, it also has places for uh, feedback on the webinar, so how, how you found WebEx as well as how you found the presentation. Um, we've had another quick question and that's just if we can get a copy of the slides. We will make the slides available in a PDF. Uh, that will go out in the email as well, but they'll also be on our website. The slides from yesterday's Maternal Index um, webinar are already online. So if you logged into that one as well, uh, they should be there for your uh, yeah, consultation. Okay, thank you for joining and I'll, I won't unmute all your phones but we'll assume that you gave Swanee a good round of applause.